If you were here last week, uh, I introduced myself. I had the opportunity to speak last week as well. My name is Dustin Miller, Coach Ryan Bush, who is the ORU men's soccer coach. Uh, he runs Sub-30. He is generally the one who is speaking and leading our Sub-30 leadership team. I'm honored to be a part of that team with him, honored to have, to have helped uh, start Sub-30 and been there since the beginning, my wife and Heather and I, and uh, we have loved being a part of uh, just helping young people. And Coach Bush, they actually have a soccer game tonight at ORU at 7 p.m., so we are cheering for them in our hearts. Appreciate you guys that came out. I know that a lot of our leadership team is there at that game cheering them on, and so um, we will do that from here. But uh, if you were here last week, I, got to, I started a two-part message on identity. And so I'm going to kind of pick up from where I left off last week. I'll go through it a little bit. For those of you who weren't here, I'll go through the notes. Um, but let me pray real quick, and then we'll get started. Father God, we praise you. Thank you for tonight. God, I thank you for the word that you have prepared for us. I thank you, Lord, that it will take root in our hearts. And Father God, that it will bear fruit in our lives. God, I thank you that tonight we're able to look into your word and see a reflection of ourselves. God, I thank you that you show us our identity in you, the confidence that we have in you, Father God, and not our surroundings and not what has spoken over us, not what has happened to us, Father God. But I thank you that we are rooted and grounded in the word of God and who you say that we are. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. So last week, uh, I started with a story about Jesus in Matthew uh, 1 and 3. And so I talked about how when Jesus was baptized, um, he came, he, he went and met with his cousin, John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was, um, he was performing the baptism of repentance. Jesus was perfect. He never sinned. He never needed to repent of anything, but he did it anyways to relate to his people, to show why he came to the earth, to show that he was going to be uh, the repentance of our sin and pay the price for all of us. It was a picture of him dying and then coming back to life, just like we just sang. And so Jesus goes, and he goes to John the Baptist, and he's like, hey, I want to be baptized. John the Baptist is like, man, I'm not worthy to baptize you. Mind you, you'll see tonight Jesus bragging about John the Baptist, how he's one of the greatest men that's ever lived up until that point, how he prepared the way for Jesus, how he was Elijah in the flesh, you know, thousands of years later. And so Jesus loved um, John the Baptist, but John the Baptist didn't feel worthy to baptize him, did it anyways because Jesus commanded it. And when Jesus came out of the water, God said, this is my son whom I love and who, with who I am well pleased. And so I made the point that God loved, validated, and affirmed Jesus before he ever did a thing. And that he's done the same for you. God sees us through the price that his son paid, um, through the price that he paid in giving his son. And through the blood of Jesus, God sees us. He loves you. He has validated you. He has affirmed you. He, has, he is encouraging you. If you look to God's word, Jesus says, come to me if you're weary and I will give you rest. I talked about that as well. Um, and then after Jesus hears the voice of his father, love and validate and affirm him, Satan came to steal the seed. So we continued in Matthew 4 where Satan came. Jesus went to the wilderness and Satan came and said, if you really are the son of God, questioning the first thing that God said, this is my son. He said, um, I will, he will, won't he order his angels to protect you? Uh, questioning the love of God. God said, this is my son whom I love. Satan said, if he really loves you, wouldn't he protect you? Jump off this building and prove his love for you. And then he came and he said, I will give you all of this, um, all of these kingdoms. And I, and I made the point that God said, I'm well pleased in him. And Satan was questioning that, saying, if he's really pleased with you, why hasn't he given you anything? Like, what, what do you have to show that God is really pleased with you in this moment? If you will bow down to me, I will show you how much it pleases me, and I will hand you over the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus obviously denied him with scripture every single time, told him to go, and he left. Um, my last two points were that insecurity breeds infidelity, how we need to be confident because as we are insecure, we begin to push others away. We begin to seek pleasure elsewhere. We can do that to God. We can do that in relationships. You can do that in marriage where your insecurity, number one, can cause you to say, you're not fulfilling my needs, and so I need to go get them elsewhere. Number two, we can, you can begin to push people away and say, I'm not going to let you into that part of my life because I'm insecure about it, and so I'm going to guard that thing, and I'm not going to allow you in, and then you wonder why you've created distance between you and that other person. And then I said that confidence breeds covenant. Had Jesus been insecure in who he was, he may have not been faithful 
to God in that moment. But because he was confident, it, it showed the covenant that he had with his father and the importance of that covenant. And so tonight, I want to talk about what about when doubt creeps in? What about, let's just say for a moment that last week you, you took it to heart, you found your identity, you said, man, God does love me. I am a child of God. I do get to partake of everything that Jesus got to partake of. I do get that, that same inheritance that Jesus received as a son and, and a daughter of Christ. And I, I, get to re- I get to receive that and I, get, I feel that validation and I begin to walk in who God has called me to be. What about when your identity is questioned. What about when something rises up against your identity, friend or foe? And to, to talk about that, I'm going to start in Matthew 10. So we're just skipping ahead a few chapters um, from where we ended last week. So last week in Matthew 4, Jesus tells Satan to go. The angels come and care for him, and immediately he starts his ministry. Um, he begins to work miracles, he begins to teach, he begins to travel, his name begins to become famous. He starts to tell people, hey, listen, if I heal you, you can't tell anybody because he realizes how popular that name is becoming and the miracles that he did. Jesus would work miracles and draw people in and then he would teach them about the kingdom of God and teach them about the power that he had, that, that same power that we have access to. The word says the same power that raised Christ from the dead, the same power that lived in him now lives in us. That's why he told us that we would do greater things than he would do because we all get to share in that power and we all get to go as his church, as his bride. We get to go and do that work together with the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. That's a big deal. So in Matthew 10, Jesus is finally beginning to duplicate himself. He's finally beginning to step into why God placed him on the earth. Obviously, he knows that he's going to pay a price. He knows that, he's gonna, that he is going to pay the price for our sin and, give us a, and allow us to be rightful heirs to the throne. And he's going to go to the, the Father and plead on our behalf at his right hand. But first, he has to duplicate himself and allow his disciples to begin to do his work on the earth so that the message can spread. And that's what he does in in Matthew 10. This is Jesus having done miracles, having taught others about the kingdom. He's saying, okay, now I get to duplicate myself. And now is where I become a leader and where I begin to send people out to do the work. This is where Jesus really, honestly, this is where the ministry really begins. It says Jesus sent out, well, in the beginning it says Jesus called his 12 disciples together and gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. And here are the names. It goes to the 12 disciples. And uh, it says, Jesus sent out the 12 apostles with these instructions. Don't go to the Gentiles or Samaritans. Go to the people of God. Don't take any money with you. He just begins to go through all of these things and how they're going to go about the, the ministry work of God. He's saying, man, don't take anything with you. Trust God. When you go into a city, find someone that will take you in because they're going to accept you. He says, look, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves, so be shrewd as snakes and harmless as doves. He spends the entire chapter of, uh, or the entire time of chapter 10, every single verse, he's just teaching his disciples how to go out, how to act like he acts, how, how, to, how to handle it whenever people reject you, how to handle it whenever people accept you, how to teach the word, how to be there for others. He says, I, I came not to bring peace on the earth, but I came to bring a sword. I come to set man against his father and daughter against her mother. He's saying, listen, there's going to be so much conflict in the kingdom. You're going to continually run into this as you go out and as you begin to fulfill the call of God on your life. He says, anyone who receives me and uh, receives the father who sent me, if you receive a prophet, and one that speaks for God, it will be given the same reward because of their righteousness And if you've been given a cup of cold water to even the least of these, you've done it for my followers. So Jesus is sending them out and saying, listen, some people are going to bless you. Some people are going to curse you. It doesn't matter. Continue to move forward. When you get to a city that doesn't accept you, shake the dust off your feet and move forward. It doesn't matter what people think about you. It doesn't matter how people people receive you. Go and do what I've called you to do. And it's interesting what plays out. In Matthew 11, mind you, I just talked about John the Baptist. He spent his entire life, his entire ministry, John the Baptist had a massive following, okay? Before Jesus, John the Baptist was the prophet to follow. So all of the people that you saw following Jesus, many of them left John the Baptist to follow Jesus. He had a huge 
ministry. He had thousands of people that would come to him and listen to him preach. They would listen to him. They, they would watch him baptize people. They would be baptized by him. Like, he was the man. Jesus goes on to say that he was Elijah that came back to the earth to prepare, to prepare the way for Jesus. So this man, this, the cousin of Jesus, who when they were in the womb, there's a story where Elijah's mom and Jesus' mom met up and Elijah leapt in the womb. They said like even before, even in infancy, even before they were born, Elijah was so excited to just be in the presence of the Messiah. He knew exactly who Jesus was. He knew exactly what Jesus came to do. And all John the Baptist talked about was preparing the way for the one that was going to rebuild the kingdom of Israel, that was going to rebuild the, the kingdom of God, and it was going to take a rightful place as the heir to the throne on the earth. John the Baptist knew exactly who Jesus was while he was working in his ministry. And it says this in chapter 11. When Jesus had finished giving these instructions to his 12 disciples, he went out to teach and preach in the town throughout the region. John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about all the things the Messiah was doing. So he sent his disciples, this is John the Baptist's disciples, he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah we've been expecting, or should we be looking for someone else? John the Baptist, I'm not worthy to baptize you. I prepared the way for you. I know exactly, you're going to establish the kingdom on the earth. This man is coming at Jesus saying, listen, I, I know what I said, and I know that I lived my entire life preparing for you, but if you understand where John the Baptist is coming from, all he, all he had was the Old Testament to go off of. All he had was, was the words from the prophet Isaiah and the words from the book of Psalms. And, like, he had the Old Testament to go off of. And he's okay, this man is going to come and he's going to establish a kingdom. And he's going to take his rightful place on the throne. John the Baptist was envisioning Israel being raised up. And like literally a palace and a king sitting on a throne. And he's like, okay, Jesus, here's the deal. I prepared my entire life for you. I laid down everything for you. But it doesn't look the way I thought it would look. So I just need to know, like, are you really the Messiah? Are you really the one that I talked about? Are you really the one that said that you were faithful? Are you really the one that said that you were going to establish a kingdom? Because I don't see a kingdom being established. Like, are you really the one that said that you were going to take a seat at the throne? Because I don't see a throne opening up for you. People hate you more and more by the day. Like, you're being tracked down just like I was. I'm sitting in prison. You're running town to town. Like, Jesus would avoid where John was because he didn't want to be captured as well. Like, John knew that he was ducking and covering. And he's like, Jesus, this doesn't look the way I thought it was going to look. So are you really who you said you were? Has anyone ever been there in their relationship with God where it's like, okay, God, I know who you are. And I, I do believe in you, but I just need to know, like, is this you? Like, is this legitimate? Like, are, are you really a God who's always faithful? Because I don't see you being faithful in this moment. Are you really a God who always causes me to triumph? Because I don't feel like this is triumph in my life right now. Like, are you really the God that all good things come from above? Because it doesn't feel like anything good is happening in my life right now. Has anybody ever been there? Or is it just me? Like, I have absolutely been in a place in my life where I'm like, God, I believe you are who you say you are, but I don't believe this is the way that I saw it happening. So what in the world? Like, how am I supposed to move forward when, when my situation looks the way that it looks right now? Are you really, are you going to be faithful? Are you really who you said you were? Because I don't see it. Is your identity, is your faith in God strong enough to bear those times? Is your strength in God strong enough? Is your foundation strong enough to say, God, even when I don't see it, even when it doesn't look the way that I thought it was going to look, even when you don't work the way I thought you were going to work, and it doesn't happen in the time that I thought it was going to happen, I'm still going to trust you. I'm not going to doubt you like John the Baptist did. And I love how Jesus responds in, uh, in verse 4. Jesus told them, go back and tell John, tell him, what you have heard and seen. The blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, the good news is being preached to the poor. And he added, God blesses those who do not fall away because of me. Jesus is telling John, John, look at my fruit. I understand that a temple is not being built and a throne is not being overturned and you don't see me sitting 
in a, in a place of hierarchy, and you don't see the government changing and leaning my way, and you don't see me taking charge over the people, but you know what is happening? People's lives are being changed. <laughs> like people are being raised from the dead, the deaf hear, the blind see. I'm doing exactly what I came to do. I'm establishing a kingdom in the hearts of the people. I am changing the lives of the people around me because I don't care about the government and, and I don't care about being in charge. I care about changing the hearts of, of, of the people of God. I want to touch their heart. I don't want to touch their pockets. I don't want to touch their rule. I, I'm not trying to touch their kingdom. I'm trying to establish a kingdom that you can't see. I am working things under the surface that you are, are not able to recognize right now. But will you just be faithful? Will you, will you not walk away because of me? Will you not fall away because of the way that I do what I'm doing? God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Do you have the faith to say, God, I don't see it, but I trust you? Hebrews 11.1 1 says this, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. It's the evidence of things that you cannot see. Faith, faith is literally the absence of sense. Like, I can't see it, I can't touch it, I can't taste it, I can't feel it, but I know that I know that I know. Like, I know that God is faithful, despite my circumstances. I know that God will come through. I know that only good things come from above. I know that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And as long as I stay diligent, he is going to reward me. I know that if I will plant seed, I understand that my God works in seed, time, and harvest. Like, I understand there's going to be some time to my harvest. I understand that I'm going to have to go through a season of allowing things to be cut off of me and allowing myself to be pruned. I see how God works in his word, and I understand that it may not always happen on my time, and our faith connects us to God. Our faith is what keeps us tethered to, that, to, to exactly what we need. It's like Wi-Fi. You can't see it, but it connects me to what I need. I, we have horrible Wi-Fi at my office, and for whatever reason, I think, I think it's like an anti-MacBook thing because I'm a Mac guy. Everyone knows are PC people. For whatever reason, anytime anyone connects to the Wi-Fi, it kicks my computer off. I can't work if my computer won't connect to the Wi-Fi. I can't see it. I don't know why it doesn't work. I don't know why my computer is the first one to not be connected to it. All I know is it like, I like want to throw my computer across the room every time it happens because like I don't know how to fix it. I can't like just plug it in. I can't see it. All I know is if I don't have those bars, I can't connect to what I need to connect to to get the job done. That's what our faith does for God. It connects us to the source. It connects us to what we need to be connected to. I have a story to kind of visual. I'm a very visual person. Uh, my dad and I, uh, my dad, God bless his soul. I love him so much. Uh, he has a bad leg right now. He's got like a, he's actually about to have surgery on his brain to relieve the pressure, to relieve the nerve damage that's going on in his body. But right now he has some symptoms that cause his leg to feel like concrete. Like he literally can barely walk. He can barely move his leg. If you ever seen me walking with a guy that's like scooting through church, that's my dad. He's amazing. Most incredible dude you'll ever meet in your life. But he's got this deal going on right now. So we go to Lowe's. He's like, hey, I need to get some mulch. Will you go with me? Can I take your truck? And then, you know, you can load it all and then unload it all. And then I'll just pay for it. And I'm like, yeah, let's do it. So we hop in my truck. We go over to Lowe's. Anybody ever been to Lowe's lawn and garden section? Okay. Anybody ever been in Oklahoma in the past three months? Okay. It is hot as Hades, like unreal. So we get to Lowe's. I'm like, Dad, you stay here. You pay. I will go. I will load up the mulch, and I'll come back. And when we get to go, I'm getting the black mulch. Just pay for it. So I get back there. Didn't realize the mistake I made. There, there are two types of black mulch. I'm like, I'm just going to get the cheap one, okay? So I'm, I got the cart. I'm loading the mulch. The cart moves about as well as my dad does right now. Like, have you, have you guys ever, like, used one of those carts? It's like one wheel spins this way, one wheel spins this way, one wheel is like a block. And so it's just like, gah, 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 you know, the whole time, you know. So I'm loading, like, 1,000 pounds of mulch onto this thing. And, like, and so my dad, I, I hear the whistle. Does anybody's parent have, like, a sound that they make? Okay. I hear, the, like, the whistle that, like, sent chills up my spine when I was four 33 years old, still sends chills up my spine. I hear the whistle. I'm loading the mulch. I turn around, and my dad is on the other side of Lowe's, and he's like, yeah. and I'm just like, I don't, I don't understand. 
And he's like, what's, what's up, mulch? And I'm like, yeah, mulch, the black mulch. I mean, we're like screaming, like forklifts, like, duh, duh, duh. you know, like everyone's like walking these flipping, broken things around. It's so loud. It's so hot. I'm sweating. I'm covered in mulch. And we're just like screaming at each other across. It's a mulch. I'm like, the black one. And I'm like, it's a dollar eighty-two. Like we're like screaming at each other, trying to communicate. And he just goes and points at his phone. And I look down and my phone's ringing. I'm like, oh, yes. So I answer the phone, and he's like, we're both dying at this point. Like, I'm bending over. I'm hot. I'm tired. We're laughing. And I was like, we had our phones the whole time. We've been screaming at each other for like five minutes, and literally all we had to do was like pick up the phone. Like, that is how close that connection is with God. Like, he wants us to be so connected to him, so tethered to him, that it's that easy to hear his voice. But so many times in our lives, we don't have the faith to, to break through the noise. And like everything going on around us, and every single person that's trying to live life and do their thing and accomplish what we're trying to accomplish around us, distracts us from hearing the voice of God. I want you to know, like, God is that close to you. He wants to be, he, I, the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. He wants to give you no doubt. He wants you to hear his voice clearly. I could have gone anywhere and just been on the phone with my dad. I wouldn't have to face him. I don't have to scream. I don't have to struggle. He's right there. His voice is right there in my ear telling me, hey, I just need to know which malt you grabbed. That's all I need to know. That's all he needed. And it took us five seconds on the phone to figure that out. God wants us to be connected to him. Our faith connects us to our Father. Our faith connects us to our Father. We have to realize how easy it is to connect to the God that created us. Hebrews 11.6 It says, Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I'm going to read that again. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is Believe that he is God and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. As we diligently seek God, he rewards our lives. And it doesn't always look the way that we think it's going to look. He rewards our lives with the gift of salvation. He rewards our lives allowing us to access to the kingdom of God. He rewards our lives with health with peace of mind, with not having to deal with the things that the world deals with, with not having to, to go through things the way that the world goes through. I don't have to scream across the parking lot to get what I need. I don't have to, to, to have the latest thing or take the latest medicine. Like, I can access my God. I can cast my cares on him, and he allows me the opportunity to experience peace that passes understanding. Faith produces salvation and salvation produces sonship. Faith produces our salvation. Right? As we come to God, we have to believe that he is. We have to have the faith in him, and we are saved. But salvation produces sonship. We're not just saved to go to heaven. We don't just believe in Jesus so that we can spend eternity in heaven. That's easy. That's the grand prize. That's a done deal. We serve God. We love God. Salvation is produced in us as we become sons of him, as we realize our sonship, as we realize our place in the kingdom, as we realize how much God loves and cares for us and how much he has given us and how much he has sacrificed for us. There is a process of salvation. We talk about this all the time in Sub 30. You'll hear Coach Bush talk about it. We will do a series on this every single year. The process of salvation is this, justif justification, sanctification, and glorification. Justification is a done deal. We are justified in Christ. It's the sanctification that hurts, right? That's the part. That's that moment where it's like, hey, Jesus, I saw, <laughs> I thought I saw who you were. I thought I knew who you were, but I'm not feeling it. I'm not seeing it. It's not happening on my time. It's not happening how I saw it happening. We think that sanctification means chosen, but it doesn't. It means set apart. Sanctification in the word is set apart, separated, purified, and cutting away. That same word was used for wheat, grapes, precious metals, stones, gems, and trees. And the way it was used in these processes was crushing wheat, pressing grapes, refining 
a refining fire for precious metals and a cutting away of stones, gems, and trees, a pruning back of trees. To be sanctified is to be crushed and pressed and refined and cut away and pruned. And that is a good process. It brings life. It brings beauty. It brings all the, it creates in us the, what God has, has put on the inside of us. It allows us to become that. It allows us to begin to live those things out. The famous saying about, the, uh, about, the, um, about David, Michelangelo said, I, I saw a stone, but when I looked at the stone, I saw David. I just had to cut away everything that didn't look like him. God is beginning a process in you to cut away everything that doesn't look like the man or woman of God that he sees in his heart. You are made in the image of God. He saw you before you saw yourself. He saw where you were going to be. He saw what you were going to be. He saw who you were going to be before you ever saw it for yourself. So allow him to do that work in you, even if it doesn't match up with your time. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 says this. We are pressed by every side. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We are knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in, de- in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be seen in our bodies. Man, sanctification is freedom for us. Cutting away allows me to be free. Laying down strongholds allows me to be free. The Bible talks about that all the time. I talked about it last week, how Jesus says, come to me. Lay those things down. Give that to me. Man, I'm free from anxiety and depression. I am free from trying to measure up. I'm free from seeking approval. I'm free from trying to be everything that the world says that I should be, everything that my parents said that I should be, everything that my teacher said that I couldn't be. Like, I am free of all of that. I'm free from what he said about me, what she said about me. I can lay that down at the foot of the cross and say, God, I am free in you. With the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom People see the word of God and they see it as captivity. Like, oh, you have all these rules and regulations and things you have to do. Man, it is freedom to be able to say, no, 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 no. I do that in response to the price that was paid for me. I'm responding to God saying, God, I love you. And therefore, I am going to live my life the way you said to live it. Because I know that all you're trying to do is protect me and allow me to live in your kingdom and allow me to live in the blessing that you have for me, 1 Corinthians 15, 36 says, Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive until it dies. What you sow is not made alive until it dies. And I'm going to let this thing die. I'm going to let this part of me die off so that I can come to life. We celebrate in the death of Jesus so we can celebrate in his life. Let that thing go. Whatever that is, that is that you are allowing to define you, that you are allowing to keep you up at night, that you allow your, that gets your heart beating fast, man, let that thing die. Worship band, you can come on up. This is that Abraham and Isaac moment where you begin to lay down your wants and needs and desires and you begin to trust God with it and then he shows up and shows you exactly who he is, that he is who he said he is. Abraham begged and pleaded with God for a son. God gave him a promise. He tried to seek it his own way. It didn't work out for him. Finally, he receives the promise of God, just like, Pastor, or just like uh, Coach Bush was talking about with Hannah. Man, he, he receives that promise, and God says, okay, now I need you to lay that thing down. Everything you hope for, everything you dreamed for, everything you lived your life for, you're old, there's no chance it happens again. It was a miracle of God. You received it, you got it, now give it back. The Bible says that Abraham got up early the next morning. He was excited to serve God. He was ready. No matter how he felt in his heart, he said, listen, it doesn't matter if it looks the way I wanted it to look, if it's in my timing, if it's how I thought it was going to go down, I'm just going to be obedient. I'm going to lay this thing down. He was obedient even to death where he tied his son up and like was, was in the action of killing his son and God rescued him and God said, listen, I counted his faith to him as salvation meant he had the faith to overcome. He didn't identify with, I'm a father. All I ever wanted to be was a father. All I ever wanted to do was have that degree. All I wanted to ever do was have that title. All I wanted to ever do was not be single. All I wanted to do was date that person. I just wanted to be married. I just wanted to be a mom. I just wanted to be a dad. Whatever that thing is that you allow to define you, Abraham didn't allow that to define him beyond his faith in God. 
He said, listen, outside of me being a father, like, like I've, I've always wanted, I'm a man of God first. I trust God first. Are you confident enough in your relationship with God to say that? Are you confident enough in your faith to say, God, I trust you first above how I feel, above how it looks, above my situation. I'm a son. I'm a rightful heir, and I'm going to act like it. Outside of my circumstances, I heard a story of uh, Queen Elizabeth when she was a child. She was sitting at the royal table, and she's a kid, so she does what kids do. They're eating dinner, and she's just slouching over in her chair. And her father, the king, says, sweetheart, sit up. Don't you know who you are? You're the heir to the throne, so act like it. Sit like it. Eat like it. <laughs> act like it now, even though you haven't taken over the throne yet. Even though it isn't yours yet. Look in the future. See what we have prepared for you. See what's in store for you. See this inheritance that we have and act like it means something to you. Act in a manner that I've called you. I've called you the heir to the throne. It doesn't matter if you haven't received it yet. It doesn't matter if you don't understand it yet. Then pull your shoulders back. Realize that God doesn't want you to be anxious. God doesn't want you to put your trust in anything but him. James 1, 2 through 6, I'm closing with this. These two passages right here. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance is a chance to grow. So let it grow. I love that James starts off his letter like this. He's saying, listen, I know it's not easy. I understand. I understand that trouble is going to come your way, and it's going to be hard, and people are going to hate you, and people are going to talk bad about you, and people are going to hurt you. But man, see it as an opportunity. Let your endurance grow. For when your endurance is developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. I don't need you to confirm my decision. I don't need you to tell me that I'm good enough. I don't need you to tell me that I'm making the right choice, that I'm, that I'm going in the right field, that I'm dating the right person. I've got the spirit of God living on the inside of me. That's enough for me. I don't need anyone else to tell me that I'm okay. I can put my faith in my God and know that even when I'm tested and even when it's hard and even when I don't see it and even when the promise doesn't make sense and even when the timeline doesn't line up, it doesn't matter because I'm a child of the king. And I know that he turns all things for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And I know that I'm called and I know that I'm loved. And I know that he's going to work it out on my behalf. You'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he'll give it to you. If you need the wisdom to get around this situation, if you need the wisdom to get through this thing, if you need the wisdom to find where you are in this moment, ask God, and he'll give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking, but when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in him alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalties is un as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed the wind. I've said this before. The secret is Christ in me, not me in a different set of circumstances. The secret is Christ in you. It's not you out of that home. It's not you out of that job. It's not you out of that situation. It's not you if that had never happened to you. It's not you if you had done something else. It's Christ in you. That is how you were made perfect. That is how you are called righteous, because of who lives on the inside of you, not because of what you've done, not because of what you've been through. It's Christ in you. True faith is about the promise, is not about the promise, it's about the promise giver. I just want Jesus. He is enough. Everything comes with him. I seek him first, and above all else, everything else is added to me. I seek his kingdom. I seek the favor of God first. If Jesus is enough, whatever you're facing doesn't matter. Remember last week, who cares who's against you? And I'll finish with this. I know I'm going long. I'll finish with this. It's very easy to feel isolated as a follower of Jesus. Because even in our circles, even in our, our core, we begin to feel resentment towards ourselves. We begin to see people acting in a way that we maybe don't want to be associated with, and then we begin to pull ourselves away, or maybe we do something that we feel like we shouldn't have done, and so we separate ourselves, and we, we begin to feel secluded. It's very easy to feel that way as you pursue the heart of God. 
Hebrews 12 says this, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, ever all the sin that so easily trips us up. Let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on who? On Jesus. Not on the stuff, not on the title, not on the person, on Jesus. The champion who initiates and perfects our faith, that faith that we have in God that tethers us to him, that allows us to hear his voice. Because of the joy awaiting Jesus, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and now he is seated in a place of honor beside God's throne. Think of the hostility he endured from sinful people, then you won't become weary and give up. And you are not secluded, you are surrounded. You are surrounded by a crowd of people. That is what this community is right here. You are surrounded by leaders that love you. You are surrounded by a church and a community that wants to see you succeed, that wants to see you pursue the heart of God, that wants to see you complete what God has called you to do, that wants to see you marry the right person, that wants to see you live out the call of God on your life. Man, God loves you. He has called you. He is going to begin to cut away what doesn't need to remain in your life. And we have to see that as a blessing in our lives.